Water and Fire by Leif Nelson. So Raymond von Zanreberg reached down and picked up a stone the size of a horse as easily as a child might grab a pebble. Even after all these years, Raymond still marveled at the ease in which that great iron titan followed his will. It had not always been so. Piloting a titan such as Farkirt was not something many knights would achieve in their lives. Weighing the stone in his hand, he reared back and threw it out across the desert sky. End over end it flew, until it broke against the shimmering dome that covered the oasis at the bottom of the valley below. Shattered rock skittered over the diamond-white shield, and Raymond saw the soldiers within raise their fists and jeer. It was the third boulder to strike the shield, and the third to make no mark upon its surface. Within the heart of the relic, Raymond frowned. What are your thoughts, Kirsa? I'm sure you have much to say. His mage's exasperated voice came through the communication rune next to his head, warped by magic. I'm still assessing the situation, she said. Throw another, but aim for the peak of the dome, and try not to fall over this time. Raymond snorted. Believe me, I have no desire to fall on my rear in front of friend or foe. I simply misjudged that first stone. His hands found another boulder, and he threw it high in the air. It crashed down in a flash of light as it bounced off the dome, disappearing over the other side. The undying soldiers cheered again, and Raymond snarled. Patience, Raymond, the gnome mage murmured. I know how much you loathe waiting out a siege, but unless you would like to wait for Berengar's forces to arrive... Don't try me, Kyrsa. There's no telling when the Undying Empire will send reinforcements. The men and animal need water. Heavens, I need water. We can't wait for Berengar any more than we can wait for Elohim's return. A chuckle rang in his ear. Well then, you'll be happy to know I have an idea. Not the brightest idea, mind you. And it involves Aurelia. Kazamde Prince and his titan graciously sacrificed their scarab shield, which the priests hastily reconfigured to envelop the valley. Once the shield was established, and with a healthy flow of mana alongside the waters in the oasis, they waited. Now, four days later, Kazamde stalked about, looking for anything he might do. The scarabs along the perimeter held their diamonds aloft to maintain the shield. The mana was flowing smoothly with nary a ripple in their connections. He walked the line where soldiers pretended they were not resting. He paid them no mind as he made his way to the temple-turned-command center. He paused to let his eyes adjust after leaving the light of the sun, bringing the concerned face of Captain Unsu into focus. The Naja captain was leaning over the table where an illusioned map of the valley lay. His tongue flitted in and out. How bad is it? Unsu looked up and snapped to attention. His hood pulled back as though in military parade. Kazumde waved him away, and the Naja relaxed. The barony is still milling about, but our divinations cannot pass through the shield any more than their weapons can. It is tenable, but not ideal. Takshau's forces are still at least three days away. They were intending to journey out into the wastes and had to be recalled. We have the supplies to last that long, but no real chance to counterattack. Kazumde sighed as the map shimmered. He heard the shield ripple, and a new series of insults rose from his soldiers. At least they weren't bored. Damn shame this town wasn't built with hardier defenses. Unsu shrugged. I doubt the locals knew how important their well would be before the ancients descended. There must be something that Caffrey and I can do, Kazumde mused, searching for an answer in the map. At the very least, we might be able to stop their knocking on our door. We have you and Caffrey to thank for that door, Prince. I would not want you to spread yourselves thin for our sake. 
Oh, it's not for your sake, Captain. Chasm Day grinned at him. It's entirely so I don't lose my mind in this valley. Return to me. Caffrey's mind echoed within Kazemdi's. I would speak with you. Chasm Day departed the captain's quarters with a nod and made his way to Caffrey's side. The priest titan stood tall, gold gleaming in the sun. Thin lines of mana streamed out to each of the scarabs, keeping the valley safe. Kazumde grabbed a handhold on the leg and pulled himself up into Caffrey's heart and let himself fall into the cushions. When his eyes closed, his vision remained, looking through the unblinking eyes of Caffrey. Well, Grandfather, what is it now? You are too impudent by half. The Titan rumbled now that they shared the same body. The barony are beginning to move. Captain Ansu was well aware of the situation. They rattle their swords and march about, while their titan has decided to spend its days throwing rocks like a boy skipping classes. Think, Chasm Day Prince. Consider your enemy as a thinking man, not a dumb animal confronted by glass. Are the scarabs untouchable? Is our mana inexhaustible? The mana mind did not allow Chasm Day a response. No defense is impregnable. Our enemy does not act idly, nor should we. Within the heart, Chasm Day grinned. Now, I do believe we agree, Grandfather. What do you propose we do, then? Raymond raised his arm, and Aurelia, the great rock, alighted upon it. He yearned to stroke her feathers with his real hand. Through their bond, he could feel how she yearned to soar, with no war to consider. After this, he thought, he would take her hunting. She deserved it. Kirsa came forth from her tower and walked precariously across the arm. She froze when Aurelia's head snapped towards her, and a warning cry pierced the air. Raymond laughed. She will not hurt you, Kirsa. She simply reminds you who could eat whom. Then tell her I've no need of reminders, she shouted, forcing herself forward. There are few creatures who could not eat a gnome, let alone a rock of the high peaks. Raymond murmured assurances to Aurelia through another rune, and the great raptor lowered its head down for Kirsa to touch. Trembling at first, the maid soon was drawing new runes upon the rock's brow. As the runes began to glow, so too did Kirsa's eyes. Oh my, she said, wonder evident even through the distortion of the runes. She sees so differently, Raymond. She sees so little and so much at the same time. She blinked and made her way back into the tower on Raymond's shoulder. She may take a boulder now. I will give the signal when to drop. Raymond checked to see that their forces had made their way to the west. The sun was setting now. It was not nightfall yet, but it would still provide cover for their charge. Only a few bannermen had stayed behind with him on the ridge, spread out as though a full company. You'll be able to direct the drop and alert the company? Kirsa snorted. I won't have to if I'm correct. The signal will be the dome's destruction. If I'm incorrect, there's no need to send a signal. Raymond directed Aurelia to a boulder. Talons cracked into stone, and she rose into the air, making circles as she flew higher and higher. This may take some time, Raymond said, searching about for his final boulder. Even Aurelia will struggle under such a weight. As long as she's able to release at the correct time. Now hush, let me concentrate. Chasm D and Caffrey wove an illusion together. It was a strange thing, Chasm D mused, to construct the image of oneself where one stood. Caffrey's frame was stock still and simple to mold to. The trouble arose in keeping the illusion while casting a cloak of invisibility at the same time. Slowly, Caffrey rose and began to move to the east, slipping through a brief gap parted by the scarabs. A jumble of boulders and steep inclines had ensured no barony men would have guards there. For the Titan, it was only a rocky hill. Grandfather, do you have any mana readings? Now that we are free from the shield, was there anything that we missed? A reservoir sits at the end of their baggage train, but no more, Caffrey rumbled. 
Their reliance on coal and steam has blinded them to magic's might. I could have told you that, Grandfather, Chasm Day chuckled. Still, it would surely be a prize to take as long as their titan is content throwing stones. True, we shall move slowly. Even a smaller titan, such as Caffrey, stood several meters above a man's head, and yet through magic and mechanical wonders, he was as quiet as a man as they made their way out of the valley. Even invisible, they had need of quiet. The clattering stone was sure to have a ballista aimed at them in haste, and a barony titan soon after. A withered copse of trees offered cover for them to overlook the enemy camp. The baggage train lay before them, unguarded save for a few wagon masters, tending to their lowing pack animals. Kazemde frowned. They certainly are confident in their position, but not even a rear guard? Unless they know of Taksharu's distance. No, this is odd. Be wary of a trap. I shall redouble my efforts. Calfrey dropped the cloak as a wisp of thin net of mana pulsed outward. Kazemde looked about, searching for what might not be evident to Magic's eye. He looked up. It is strange to see an eagle this far south. Calfrey's mind froze. I sense no eagle. There, to the north of the camp. Shouldn't you sense it, even if it's an illusion? Yes. Caffrey sent a series of images to Kazemde of the supposed eagle, with other eagles in comparison. Because it is not within my sensors. It is much higher. But that would mean... Kazemde flinched as he realized. The rock. They found a way to pierce the shield. Caffrey pulled itself to its full height, head emerging from the trees. I do not have the speed to return to the valley. Kazemde lowered himself fully into the cushions. Go, Caffrey. If they seek to overtake us, let it not be a surprise. He took control of the illusion they had left behind, his mind speaking through the apparition's ma. The enemy approaches! Raymond frowned at the scene below. Undying soldiers were beginning to muster below. Something's agitated them. Have they discovered our forces? Kirsa's voice was strained from sustaining multiple magics. Raymond surveyed the valley. They appear to be taking up post around the entire perimeter. They are alert, but to the west, no more than the north and south. He paused, and the titan moves not at all. Can we not release yet? Not yet, Kirsa said through gritted teeth. If they are alert, then this is our only real chance, and I will not waste it when their titan has not seen fit to engage. Raymond busied himself at his controls, so as not to lose his mind. Falkert was a marvel, but a marvel with a thousand and one things that could go wrong. His ballista was armed, his furnace core burning well. His gears were well oiled, and no tubes or hoses were showing any strain. All was ready, save for a single bird flying high. Caffrey's golden form ran across the desert faster than any steed. Inside the Titan, Kazumde coordinated with Unsu, attempting to determine where the enemy was. The rock carries a boulder. Kazumde scanned the image Caffrey sent him, now that they were in range. You mean they are trying what they have before? There is no mana reading, no runes at work. I sense minor communication magics. Kazumde barked a laugh. Then we have given away our presents for nothing, Grandfather. What do they seek with these antics? The shield is not impenetrable. You know this as well as they. The shield is not meant to be impenetrable, but it has withstood the attacks thus far. They have no artillery, not even an array of ballista. The shield may falter, but it will resume. Kazumde's eyes widened. Lock on to the rock! Glyphs alighted upon the distant bird. Kazemde cried, Launch missiles! Magic burst from the eye of Horus on his shoulder. He raised his mana cannon and aimed for the barony titan. Fire! Raymond saw the streaks of light rising from the east towards Aurelia. Kirsa, stop, now! I do not have the necessary... Mana fire rocked both of them as a blast hit Falkert. Aurelia, drop! The speck in the sky diminished as Aurelia tucked in her wings and fell. Kirsa's voice scraped against Raymond's ears. She does not have the height, Raymond. She will be a smear across the shield. Raymond threw his boulder 
to dash across the dome and reached for a larger one with both of his titanic hands. She will not. Oh, you godforsaken! Kyrus's voice lurched as Raymond heaved the boulder onto the titan's shoulder. Another shot rattled through Falkirt. Damn you, Raymond! There is an undying titan firing on us! Raymond watched as the light trails arced down to chase Aurelia. We must trust that Barony Steel will hold. Tell me when to launch. Kirsa hissed in anger, and Raymond could hear her strapping herself into her harness. Throw when I tell you, Raymond. A diagram lit in Raymond's eyes, showing the arc to follow. When I say, and no sooner. Aurelia plummeted, the boulder still locked in her talons. Raymond held his breath as she was buffeted by the air. She let go, and the stone overtook her. Ready, Raymond. He lifted the large boulder, metal gears squealing under the strain. Smoke began to pour out from his core. Launch! Raymond heaved the boulder up, and the enemy titan was upon them. Kazimde swung for the boulder and missed, a curse on his lips. He followed through to slam his gravitic scepter into the baronic titan. Finally, the mighty armor cracked, but still his scepter bounded off with a clamor. He danced back as the falconer unsheathed the longsword as tall as a building. Caffrey, have you locked onto their ley lines? You have your duel, prince, the titan rumbled. Leave me to mine. Kazumde paced sideways as the falconer launched a bolt from its ballista. The shaft went whistling into the red sky. Then we duel. The boulder sailed through the air. For a brief moment, it was surpassed by Aurelia's dropped stone, and they struck the dome within a breath of each other. The shield flashed and flickered, and the rock burst through the shuddering light, and was upon the scarabs as though they were goats from her high peaks. Her beak and claws tore through their brass hides, scoring deep gouges into metal quickly before leaping to the next. Above, the magic missiles trailing her erupted against the reformed shield, flickering it again. Manifire shot ink through the dome. The undying had turned around as the enemy was among them, and though some volleys burned at Aurelia's wings, just as many shot into its allies. But most struck earth or light, and the added strain fractured the dome into an eggshell. The shield's light parted like rivulets of water into a web that dissipated as the rock tore a diamond from the last scarab's claws and flew west, screeching her victory over the roaring cry of a barony charge. He's trying to take over Falkert's systems. Kirsa's voice came through over the squeal of steam in Raymond's ears. Light danced before his eyes as runes and glyphs whipped through the air, tearing and reforming as his mage battled against the unyielding stare of an Eye of Horus. He parried the undying titan's scepter again, the gravitic forces reverberating up and into the core to rattle his teeth. But his blade survived, and so they fought. He cursed as another bolt struck where the titan had been an eye blink ago. He swung out as the enemy stepped too close and found his blade unimpeded as it swept through an illusory scepter. He didn't have time to turn his head before he was rocked by a mana barrage that scattered the frame of his ballista. Kirsa, I've run out of ranged options. Can you spare any mana? I can't. They're working their way inside, and I don't know what they'll be able to do with the systems I've set up. I'm going to have to shut it all down. Kazumde hooted as the ballista burned. No more illusions, Grandfather. Focus all efforts on taking over their magics. I almost have. Indeed, Kazumde could see as much. The white glyphs of Caffrey's spells had begun to latch onto the barony titan, light spreading over the armor form as a shroud. The titan struggled against the light until it froze, tangled in the pose of an ancient statue. Let us finish him. Kazemde hefted his scepter in his hands and flew forward. The scepter hummed through the air and smashed into the falconer, metal shattering out in sharp chunks. Gears and sparks flew. Kazemde reared back for another strike and cried, The sun shall outlast you! The falconer's arm caught the scepter and gripped it tight, splintering it. The shroud of light tore away as the armored titan pulled Caffrey closer, and they both fell over the side of the valley. They plowed through earth and uprooted bush and tree as they tumbled down, their great forms pulverizing everything in their path. Raymond grappled with the undying titan, 
tearing at every handhold he could find. They crashed into a house. The stones flew out and struck barony and undying alike. Mana and arrows bounced off the titans as soldiers' discipline collapsed in the carnage of two relics of Armageddon, brawling in the dirt. Kazimde clawed and scraped, seeking to free himself from the barony titans' grasp. What happened? Why are they able to fight? All ley lines are severed, Prince. They fight by steam and metal now. Raymond grasped out at the thrashing, undying titan, and his fingers closed on the eye. Without his magic, it was as though his nerves were dead, and he had to trust the shaking view from his periscope as sweat salted his eyes. He brought both hands to the sharp oval and pulled. A scream of light erupted from the golden titan's shoulder as the eye burst. Pain blossomed in Chasm Day's shoulder as the eye was rent apart. Fear suffused him as Caffrey's passive magics unraveled. No, this is not how a prince of the Undying Empire would meet his end. His hands found the scepter and found the crack in its haft. He bent the scepter further, gravitic magics spiraling out like a storm, and shoved the breaking ends into the open core of the barony titan. Fire blasted the titans apart. Kazunde lifted himself up from the wreckage of the village, one arm spilling pure mana into the ground, scouring it. Come, Caffrey, he coughed. They have not defeated us yet. They have, said his grandfather. The falconer still stands. No, Kazimde whispered, but it was true. The titan stood hunched. Its sword propped it up as a crutch, but it stood. Kazimde began to ready the cannon. Then we shall finish him. We will retreat, Caffrey said, implacable. The titan ignored Kazimde's commands and began to disengage from the oasis. The Empire has lost the oasis. It will not lose a titan. You are a coward! And you are proud. But we will live despite your pride, and because of my cowardice. Kazimde wiped tears from his eyes as the titan moved to the edge of the village, readying to climb the cliffside. Hold! I will not! Hold! For the lives of our men, hold! The titan stopped. Kazimde turned and observed the chaos. The remnants of the Undying Company had crouched behind a small temple. An enormous explosion came from the north, and gravel rained down upon them. We will give them cover, he ordered. Caffrey moved immediately, laying down its wounded arm to block the alley to a collapsed granary. Kazimde opened the core and hung out to shout, To me! To Caffrey! Some soldiers broke free immediately. Others were frozen, staring at him with fear, while some were firing over the rubble, unable to hear even a dozen yards away. Kazimde saw Captain Unsu, his hood bleeding, fire mana directly into a barony man's helmet. The Naja saw him and began making his way towards them when the barony titan came forward and belched flames from its torso onto them. Six soldiers made it to Caffrey. The rush of heat forced Kazemde to close the heart, one man slipping and falling into the conflagration. Smoke filled Kazemde's lungs, and he coughed out unintelligibly. Caffrey needed no instruction, and lifted itself up and ran into the setting sun. Raymond squinted out at the carnage he had wrought. Trees, bodies, and buildings alike burned from the heat of his furnace core. The controls were seared to his palms. A panel above Raymond's head creaked open, and Kiersa's wild and sooty face looked within. Raymond, you've done enough. The undying retreat. We need to get out of here. Raymond glanced about. None of his readings were live. With his ley lines burned out, he couldn't know for sure how Falkirt was faring, but he felt the titan rumble. He heard the gears squealing for their lives. He knew what was happening. He reached out for Aurelia, calling her back. Aurelia's coming, he called up, weakly. She'll get us out of here. I need to leave the village. He began to force Falkirt's body to the west. His men pushed away, cheering their battered champion as they swept through the oasis. Every step shook Raymond as his internal stabilizers failed. A screech from above announced Aurelia's arrival. He reached out and bid her farewell. We did this because of you, old girl. 
Out loud, he called up to Kirsa. Get on her. Not until you come out, you oaf. Tears streamed through the grime on her face. We can figure this out. I can cool Falkirt off. She began to weave an ice spell, but even through the heat, Raymond could see she didn't have the energy. Take her, Aurelia. I will see you at Elohim's side. Kirsa yelped as Aurelia took her in her beak and they shot into the sky. Raymond surged forward as the flames made their way into the heart. He stabbed Falkert's sword into the earth and leaned his back against it, ensuring that the oasis would have at least an iota more protection. His vision swam as the heat cooked him. All the barony! Falkert's furnace core erupted, consuming everything in a moment. Fire shot from every crack and chink in the titan's armor, turning the sand to molten glass. The cheering barony quieted as the wave of heat hit them. The blaze burned for minutes before sputtering to a dull crackle. The great falconer titan, blackened and broken, fell. In the sky, the sun sank below the horizon and a rock of the high peaks cried out.